Hi, friends. Hey, good morning. Uh, Brother Mike, Sunday morning podcast. It's 9 o'clock Pacific time, 9 o'clock in Arizona. It's noon on the East Coast. Thank you for tuning in. Enjoy being with you every Sunday. Got another good one for you today. Currently, I'm in Oceanside, California. My uh, father-in-law's in hospice. Unfortunately, he's, he's dying. He's not doing well. So, uh, my wife and I came out to uh, to help him and uh, arrange uh, medical care and all those other things that you do. And uh, life isn't a bowl of cherries, is it? No, it sure isn't. There's uh, a lot of tough things in life, but you keep your praise up and you keep your faith up and every rotten experience turns out to be, in the long run, a benefit to you. And so uh, this horrible experience in hospice uh, is going to turn out to be something good for me and my wife. And uh, we're ready to go. We're going to, as brother, as the Lord Jesus said to Brother Jarius about his dying daughter, she had died on the way back to his house. Brother Jarius looked at Jesus and said to him, I'm scared to death. That was the look on his face, petrified with fear. And he heard these words, three of them, keep on believing. That's what you're going to do. I run uh, hardcorechristianity.com. I also run the Arizona Deliverance Center in Phoenix. I don't run it all by myself. Huh? Far from it. I'll tell you what, I got a monumental staff there. Several people on the staff have like uh, breakneck anointings. I'm so grateful to have them. Please remember, too, Thursday and Friday nights at 7 o'clock, we have preaching, teaching, healing, and deliverance at both of those live services. Both are broadcast on our YouTube teaching channel. Of course, I'm on every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock on my podcast. Also, remember, we have three live Zoom deliverance services, Mondays, 6.30 p.m. Pacific time for the ladies only, and then Wednesday and Saturday for everybody else. And these services are freaky anointed. 
it's absolutely amazing. Sometimes I tune in on these uh, Zooms and you know, I get like, wow, literally everybody on the Zoom is going through deliverance all at once. So that's, a, that's the level of anointing on these Zoom services. We also have that anointing at the live services as well. Don't forget about next Saturday is our children's deliverance service. This thing is absolutely spectacular. The Carters are there to take care of it for us. It's fabulous. Starts at 10 o'clock next Saturday. That's the first Saturday of November. And can you believe it's November? That's unreal. I need to give you some election voting advice. Whoever you're going to vote for, make sure you vote your Christian values. And of course, neither party has any Christian values. They're all a bunch of lying, thieving, gutless criminals. But this year, uh, one party has a little more Christian values than the other. For example, uh, I'm voting against the party that's in favor of transitioning children from one sex to the other. I'm against the party that is opening the borders, southern and northern, to uncontrolled illegal immigration allowing millions of people to enter our country who are unvetted and unvaccinated. Can you believe that? Would you? Would any country in their right mind let in 15 million people unvetted and unvaccinated? Uh, and I could go on and on about the party I'm voting against. So I don't like either party myself. That's just a personal personal view. I'm not asking you to adopt it. But I do vote for the least satanic party of the two. Okay, they're both satanic, but I go for the least satanic one of the two, and I hope you'll do the same. Uh, take a look at uh, Luke chapter 13. You know, as I've mentioned numerous times over the years, the Gospels are the four greatest books ever written, and John of the four is the greatest book of the Gospels. But... Uh, the beloved Luke, the physician, wrote a gospel, and uh, his gospel is very interesting. It's a little more detailed than the other ones, and he's got some interesting experiences in his gospel that the others do not have. And here's one of them. When you go to church, um, when you go to church, every church you go to, no matter what it is, always remember that... Um, it's filled with a lot of good people. It's filled with a lot of people with good hearts. It's also filled with people who are infected with demons, and it's also filled with hypocrites. But the fact that people are infected with demons in your church or they're hypocrites and they're in your church is no reason not to go to church. How do I know that? Because Jesus set the example. Here it is, Luke chapter 13, verse 10. As Jesus was teaching... In one of the synagogues on the Sabbath day, behold, there was a woman there, Greek word gune. Gune is the Greek word for a wife. And apparently this woman was married or had been married. And it says she had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. Okay. What does that mean? Number one, she's infected with demons. Number two, she's in church on Saturday. For the synagogue service, a demon, demon infected people routinely go to church. In Mark chapter one, Jesus is teaching at another synagogue and right in the middle of his sermon, some guy on the set in the front row starts screaming and manifesting demons. Mark chapter one. You can read it yourself. It's it couldn't have been any clearer. So we do. We don't sit around going, well, I don't go to church because there's a bunch of hypocrites there. Well, if, even if there were no hypocrites there, if you go there, then now they're there. We go to, you go to church whether there's demon-infected people or hypocrites or not. Okay, that's not the purpose of you going to church. You're a worshiper, not a community nitpicker. And this woman had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. That means that 18 years a little over 18 years before this woman met Jesus in the synagogue that day, she did not have the spirit. The thing got in her body 18 years ago. And it says she was so bowed 
together, this is the King James Bible, the Greek word is sunkupto. Sunkupto means to be bent forward, kind of like a hunchback, almost not to the side, not scoliosis twisted, but bent forward. That would be the medical condition we currently call kyphosis. It says she was so bent forward, she couldn't even lift herself up anymore. She couldn't even stand up. When Jesus saw her, here's another great truth in, 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 in the word here. Whenever you go to church, God sees you. Whether you're infected with demons or whether you're a hypocrite or whether you're just a wonderful person serving the Lord, God sees you. And it says he called to the woman. Right? And he says to her, wife or woman, gune, you are loosed. Apaluo is the Greek word. Luo is the uh, root of it. Luo means to lose something. Apoluo luo means to totally and completely lose it. He said, woman, you are totally and completely loosed from your infirmity. And then it says he laid his hands on her. And immediately, when the spirit left, obviously, she was... She straightened up. She stood up. And then she started to do what? Glorify God. And that's the purpose of healings, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, we don't, we don't uh, pray for people to be healed just because, look, you know, we're bored with nothing to do. Healings give Father the glory he deserves and expects. Healings bring praise to the Lord Jesus, which he deserves which he expects. And that's what happened here. She, she, she stands up and she's so relieved to be delivered from this demon of infirmity that she is full of praise. You know, and that's the purpose of having healing or a miracle or an answer to prayer. It all leads back to your praise. Because in your praise, in the joy of your praise, that's where your real strength comes. And then suddenly, uh, uh oh, there was a hypocrite in the church that day. And on this day, it happened to be <laughs> the, the pastor of the church. Okay, the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation. Indignation. Aganaktoi. Indignation. Greatly grieved is what that Greek word means. Indignation is, is a byproduct, is a symptom of religious spirits. When people are indignant in church, most of the time, not all, most of the time, it's a religious demon. It's a religious de demon controlling the services. They don't control everything in the service. They can't do that, but they can kind of control the, the boundaries of the service. For example, you may have a wonderful worship praise portion of your service, but after the service is over, nobody got healed and nobody got delivered. So you can see the demons can't control everything in a service, but they can put parameters around the service so that it's ineffective based on the true gospel of Christ. All services are supposed to have altar calls with healing and deliverance. All services. You're not supposed to just come there and sing, pay your tithe, donate some money, see your friends, uh, pretend you're doing well when you're not, listen to a teaching or sermon, and then go to Golden Corral. You're not supposed to do that. There's supposed to be the moving of the spirit. And that's what we have unique about the Arizona Deliverance Center and formerly the House of Healing. In every single service, 100% of the time, the spirit of God moved. 
and you say, well, he moves at our, our church too. We sing and we praise and we're happy. No, I mean, I'm talking about the moving of the spirit where it's the Holy Ghost is manifesting and demonstrating his presence. That's how powerful the Arizona Deliverance Center is. It's absolutely amazing. And you ought to take advantage of it. I hope you'll visit soon. He looks over with indignation. Religious spirits are in this guy. So this is the second demon-infected person in one service we've run into when Jesus was the guest speaker. He was indignant that Jesus had healed on the what? Sabbath day. Okay, and here you see the insanity of the Sabbath and why it was abolished in the New Testament. We don't have a Sabbath now. They had That was a uh, law of Judaism. The new covenant doesn't have Sabbaths, okay? Every day is a Sabbath in the New Testament. Only Saturday was, was the main Sabbath. They had hundreds of other Sabbaths. But Sunday was the main Sabbath in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, every day is a Sabbath. Christ is our Sabbath here. So this guy's religious demons manifested, and he's upset that this woman got healed on the Sabbath day. Now notice religious demons have no compassion and no concept of human suffering. Absolutely none, because they're behind it. They're not going to have a fit over their own works. When somebody has a religious demon, they always put pomp and pageantry above the needs of human beings. You see it clearly in every religious demon. They're very powerful, very smart, and very self-centered. This guy couldn't care less that this woman had been suffering for 18 years. He knew she had been suffering for 18 years because it was, it was spoken out in the service. Jesus mentions it later. And this guy then turns around to Jesus. Now, this is how bold religious spirits are. These religious demons are telling Jesus what to do. They're bossing him around. Can you believe that? Religious demons boss God around. They run almost all the churches. They're in charge. And they boss the good Lord around. And this religious demon inside this ruler synagogue says to him, there are six days when people should come here to work and come and be healed. But you're not supposed to come on the Sabbath. This demon is actually insulting Jesus in front of the entire congregation. This guy is humiliating God in front of the entire congregation. Do you believe that? Yes, verse 14. Read it yourself. Luke 13, 14. Then Jesus responds to the man who was listening to the religious demon in his brain. He says, you hypocrite. You hypocrite. Hey, if you need to loose your ox or your ass when they finish eating, don't you take them out to loose them and take them out for, to get a drink on the Sabbath? What's wrong with you? Yeah, that's what it says. Here's exactly what it says. Each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him to water him. Now, that Greek word for stall there is kind of interesting. And the fatne. Fatne is the same Greek word used to describe Jesus' birthplace. They laid him in a manger or a fatne, which is a food trough for animals. That's where Animals eat. It's not a stall that was mistranslated in the King James Bible. It's a food trough. Well, after you feed your animals, your oxes and your asses, don't you send them out and get watering on the Sabbath day? Then Jesus ap appeals to this man's compassion and mercy, which are non existent. He says, Should not this wife, Gune, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound. Now notice that the spirit of infirmity 
was not Satan, but was a messenger of Satan. All demons are messengers of Satan, and they do his will and his work. They do exactly what they're told. So when a demon does something, it's the same as Satan doing it. Satan bound this woman for 18 years. Everybody knew she'd been bound for 18 years. She must have told them. Everybody heard it, including this fake pastor. Shouldn't she be loosed from this bondage on the Sabbath? And it says, when he said these things, his adversaries were ashamed. And all the people rejoiced. Notice that? Religious demons always work with the hierarchy, and then they filter down. They get the pastoral staff, and then they filter down to the congregation. And the people, the regular people, who just wanted the mercy and grace of God, they were happy at what Jesus was saying and what Jesus was doing. They didn't like these religious people either. Then Jesus tells a very interesting parable after this scene, and he's still in the synagogue teaching. Okay, verse 18. It's interesting he added these two together, which was fascinating. He connects it. He's still standing there. This is after the hypocrite starts blabbing. This is after the wife was delivered from demons and her body was healed. It's in the same service. He said, what is the kingdom of God like? How, how does it resemble? What does it resemble? It's like a grain of mustard seed. Teeny tiny. That a man throws into his garden. And it grew. And it got strong. It became a huge tree, it says in the Greek. But, it says, but the fowls of the air, the birds, lodge in the branches of this great tree. What was he doing there? Illustrating the service he was standing in at that very second. The kingdom of God grew spectacularly during that service. And the people saw teaching they never heard before. They saw miracles they'd never seen before. But in the same service, the birds symbolic of demons, were in the synagogue and lodged in the branches, watching everything, listening to everything, influencing everywhere they could. Wow. And they had taken over this pastor of the synagogue, I meant the ruler. He had been taken by the birds. Yeah, the only thing they didn't have in that service was Alfred Hitchcock. He didn't come in that day. Can you imagine it? Here we have the synopsis of the Church of God. The powerful anointing of the Word. It's like a seed, a teeny tiny seed. If you put that seed in the ground, you bury it just right, you water it just right, you nourish it, you take care of it, it grows to a huge tree. Huge, but the demons have a, another phase for your church. What is that? They send in the demons and they lodge in the church and the Christians in the church allow the demons to stay in the church. The pastoral staff, the ministers, allow the fowls of the air 
Then he says in the same service, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman, same Greek word, gune, a wife, took and hid in three measures of meal. Until the entire loaf was leavened. Yeah, this piece of bread, like the church, hears the gospel. But not everybody receives it. And then it says he left the synagogue and didn't teach anymore that day. What a day he had. I'd love to have been in that service, wouldn't you? <laughs> I would love to have seen that. I would have paid some real money to get in on that service because I don't think that's all the things that happened. In fact, I'm sure of it. There were a whole bunch of people healed. There was teaching like you can't even believe, just off the chain, incredible. What are you going to do with your ministry? Well, first of all, you're obviously going through deliverance. You're obviously going to de develop your prayer life. You're obviously going to be, develop good Bible habits. Yes, you're obviously going to make sacrifices for your, for your anointing and for your ministry, and you're going to become an extremely dangerous human being for the Lord. Danger to who? A blessing to humans, but a danger to demons, the fowls of the air are in your church. So when you walk in that church on Sunday morning, it says they're in the branches. It didn't say they were on the ground. How you doing, brother? No, that may not be the demon. They're in the branches looking down at you. They're on the pastoral staff looking at the crowd. The church accountants are figuring up the offering that morning. Yeah, the the fowls are in the accounting room, kind of like a casino. Everywhere you go in your church, the fowls are in the branches. Yikes. Watching. Listening to everything you say. Even if you whisper it. If you whisper it, they hear you. They hear you. They're watching you. And if you get out of line, they're going to put the heat on you. Got an email in yesterday. I get them all the time. Brother Mike, I started doing deliverance a week, a month, a year ago. And oh my gosh, everything went bad in my life. I can't believe it. Why is everything going so bad? I, I went, I had a couple of good deliverance sessions. I feel like I'm going through hell sitting in a handbasket. Well, you are, friend. You are doing that. That. Why do you think that's happening? Because they fear you. They're afraid. They're afraid you're going to finish your deliverance and get them all out. They're afraid you're going to change and renew your mind and develop a different type of thinking pattern. And they're afraid you're going to develop an attitude, you know. They, they're they afraid you're going to, uh, you know, go see an ox and an ass and kick them out of the stall. And they're afraid. They don't want you to become their enemy. They don't want you taking advantage of them. Why are they so scared? Who are you? Well, you're a nothing, but if you add the anointing to you, you become, friend, Godzilla. You, you become King Kong to them because they know the Holy Ghost. Trust me. They've never seen him. Nobody's ever seen him, but they know when he's around. Everybody does. And they fear him. He's the only person in the universe, demons truly fear. And if you learn 
to use your anointing and the Holy Spirit and his power, they will panic when you come around. They will panic. Sometimes demons start manifesting for no reason just because you're there. They're scared. They're afraid. They're afraid you won't just be a regular church person and a run-of-the-mill Christian anymore. They're, they're afraid you might decide to become a disciple. Whoa. Why do you think they fear people getting healed? Well, most of them, they don't. But every once in a while, when somebody gets healed, they're o overly grateful. And they decide to become a disciple. That's why they hate healing. They don't like seeing you get healed. They don't like you feeling better. Obviously, they don't like anything that's good. But what they really hate about it is 1 out of 10, 1 out of 20, 1 out of 100, 1 out of 1,000 people who get healed turn into a disciple whom they fear. Christians, they don't fear. They have a belly aching laugh rot over Christians. It's hilarious. Christians are just absolutely worthless to them and completely ineffective. A disciple? Mmm. Wow. That they, that they can't take. They cannot take that. They will not tolerate that. They can't tolerate it. Because the person they fear the most lives in here where you live. And if you decide to become a disciple, you will become instantly famous in the spirit world. Instantly famous. Weird things will start to happen to you to try to stop you. Guess what? The fowls of the air, they cannot overrun your free will. They can influence it. They can intimidate it. They can provoke it. But they can't overcome your free will. They have no power over it. They can't do it. The only power they have over your free will is what you give them. How about a prophecy then? I'm prophesying over you today. You're not going to give them an inch and you're going to take a mile. Yeah. The birds of the air may be up in the branches at your church, in your home, at your office, what have you. But they're not in here. Today is the accepted time. Now is the day of sozo, deliverance, and salvation. This is your day. Are you being attacked by the devil? Congratulations. Could you send me an email so I can ask for your autograph? People who are being attacked are being attacked for a reason. There aren't any random attacks. That doesn't happen. The fowls of the air sit up in the branches. They look down, and when they strike, they see an opening. Right? Remember that movie, The Birds? Yeah, the birds were all gathering out on the swing sets and the and the and in the school playground. Remember that? On the monkey bars? The birds were on the monkey bars. Remember that? You probably don't remember that. So I'm, I'm an older person. I, I remember that movie, The Birds. You probably never heard of it. Anyway, these birds have gone stark, rave, and crazy. Of course, they lived in California. Of course. And they decided to start attacking people. And the teacher, Suzanne Plachette was her name, the actress. She was the teacher in that movie. She told them to organize quietly. And we're going out the back door. And when she gives a word, you run for your life. And that's what happened when the birds on the playground and on the monkey bar saw them and on the fences, they were waiting for them. When they saw them running, they saw an opening. They took off. Notice they didn't attack while they were in the building, in the school. 
Notice, you got to notice that? Yeah, they didn't. They waited till they ran. See, what was going on there? Well, the churches, the churches are loaded with Christians. They're cowards. And when they get outside the church, they run. And then what happens? The fowls of the air lodge in the branches. Chase them. I got news for you. You've run from the devil your last day. And today's the day. Today is the day you stop running. Mm -hmm. You're going to turn around and fight back. With personal carnal weapons? No, 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 no. No. No, you're not. Yeah, you, we tried that. That didn't work. I've done that before. It doesn't work. Carnal weapons don't work. I've, had, I've tried to get mad on a human level, and, you know, I tried to study harder and, you know, think faster. It was a failure. No, our weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Far from it. You need to start taking advantage and using the person the only person the demons truly fear. They truly fear him, the Holy Ghost. That's what you're going to do. And you're going to stop running and you're going to turn around and stand there for with the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and against the wilds of the devil. The wilds? Methodius, what is that? The methods, the techniques, the tactics of Satan. Because you're ready to go. You're going to finish your deliverance. You're going to develop good Bible habits. You're going to develop your prayer life and your praise life. And you are going to be a cold-blooded killer. I'll see you next time. I sure love you. See you next Sunday.